Well, let's see, according to my clock, it's noon. So I'm just gonna go ahead and kick things off. And as people come in, they'll, they'll catch up with us. But I would love to thank all of you for joining us today. Um, my name is Alice Wood, and I'm the Director of Gift Planning for DuPage Foundation. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with DuPage Foundation, we're considered DuPage County's philanthropic leader. We were founded in 1986 by a group that was determined to raise the quality of life for um, others in DuPage County. And in a sense, I feel like we're the United Nations of philanthropy. We uh, help people and organizations realize their unique charitable goals. We provide impactful support to our communities, not-for-profits through our grant making and initiatives. And we foster key partnerships to address critical issues affecting our community. And as you can tell today, we also offer educational opportunities to promote philanthropy. So since our creation, the foundation has given away more than $60 million on behalf of our donors throughout DuPage County and beyond. And there's this great saying that when the tide comes in, all ships in the harbor rise. And in a sense, we're here to help those people who have been part of the, <laughs> the rising tide and they're determined to give back. We also serve as a re resource to professional advisors and charitable, charitably inclined individuals and business owners. And today, this um, program was really a group effort of our professional advisor committee. Um, we have an advisory committee, of a mix of accountants, lawyers, financial advisors, and you know, everybody weighs in on what might be interesting. So this was definitely a group effort. And today, this is pretty exciting. You're all part of the launch of our professional advisor, advisor roundtable. And um, thanks to COVID, we are not limited in our numbers, so we could have everybody join via Zoom. And we know you have a million different ways to spend your time, and we really do appreciate you joining us today. And for some of you that um, signed up and then emailed and said they couldn't make it, this is being recorded, so anybody will be able to share this afterwards. Um, so joining us today are our panelists, and we have Randy Fox, who is, um, can you raise your hand, Randy? I guess your name's there too, but um, who's uh, calling in from San Diego, lucky guy. And then we have Mark Lane, who's an attorney in Chicago and has written 36 books. So clearly this is a man who never sleeps. And then <laughs> we're awfully lucky to have Roy Spencer because there's nothing like hearing from somebody who walks the walk to be part of this program today. And so the, they're gonna share their insight about today's topic, which is conscious capitalism through philanthropy and social impact, how you and your business and business clients can do well by doing good. And boy, is that a mouthful. <laughs> so what this is and who it helps and how it works and why it matters, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. And so because it's a panel format, we'd like the panelists to jump in whenever. Um, other than to start with, I'd like to ask everybody on the panel like the why behind why they're doing what they're doing and a little bit about their background so we can all get a feel for why this matters to them. And Randy, let's start with you. <laughs> um, You're I, I started in the planning business in 1984, actually with a planning practice in Naperville, a couple of other partners. Uh, but as you can tell by looking at me, I'm also a child of the 60s. And the 60s was all about change. Uh, you know, we were wanting to change the world and make it a better place. Um, and as I started to learn uh, my trade, um, lots of things happened that sort of drove me toward learning more about philanthropic planning. One, the first thing was actually an accident, which is the 86 Tax Act took away a lot of the tax planning that uh, advisors were able to do. And so I was charged with learning new, new things. And so I, I went off and started uh, learning about charitable trusts. And that drove me down this path of uh, helping people incorporate philanthropy into their uh, into their life in, in a completely new and different way. And so I've been using philanthropic planning and tools in my practice for all that time, for the last 35 years. And probably I'm one of the few, not financial advisors anymore, but as estate planning advisors who actually does on a day-to-day -day basis integrate charitable planning tools into virtually every client's uh, plan in some way or another. Uh, and I work with, my, my practice is now only a business to business 
So I only work with financial advisors, attorneys, and CPAs across the country uh, who have large client matters uh, and unsolved problems. And I, I try to add the charitable planning element to those places where it's appropriate, which is in almost every place. Um, and a lot of my clients are, most of the very wealthy clients I deal with are business owners or their business is the business of real estate. Uh, inevitably, I'm meeting them at a point in which there is some major transition in their life taking place, a sale of a business, the sale of the real estate, uh, bringing the second generation in, whatever it is. And if we can intervene with uh, really conscious charitable planning, uh, we can make a huge difference, not only for them, but also for the community around them. Um, most, uh, many business owners don't think of themselves as charitable, uh, but in many cases, their favorite charity might be the IRS and they just don't know it. Um, we try to give them the option of eliminating the government and putting charities in their place. Uh, and that often has great appeal. Oh, that's awesome. No, oh, thanks. It's a really good good, well-rounded background of what you do. Um, and then how about you, Mark? You, you've t If you could tell everybody too about your multiple careers, because um, it's it's not just being an attorney, is it? Oh, gosh. Uh, Alice, thank you so much and for your kind words, and it's a pleasure to be with everyone. Um, multiple careers. I don't know. What are my multiple careers? Um, I pr I'm a corporate and tax attorney. Uh, I think our law firm represents more uh, social enterprises, mission-driven ventures than any other law firm in the country, uh, operating nationally, operating globally, but also assisting traditional businesses and expanding what it means to pursue a corporate social responsibility agenda in this uh, age of COVID and racial reckoning, and finally, serious attention to the existential threat of climate change. Uh, I do currently run the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation, uh, I wrote the law creating that commission. Uh, it is a permanent agency of county governments that incubates actionable social policy recommendations for the Cook County Board. Uh, written a lot of legislation in this space, including the low profit limited liability company law, which we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, also ran Governor Quinn's task force on social innovation, entrepreneurship and enterprise. And I do a lot of writing, I enjoy it. and. Uh, keeps me current on areas that I don't necessarily practice day by day, but it also uh, allows me to kind of um, leverage my thought leadership uh, with respect to market-based strategies to drive social change, which is much as what we're going to be talking about today. So thank you for that opportunity, Allison. Again, it's a pleasure to be with everybody. So wait, Mark, I've got to back up. Are you also a child of the 60s? And that's kind uh, of ind <laughs> Indeed I am, or was, <laughs> oh, and, you're still am. and uh, I started out in my career as, uh, as a, an attorney who represented high income, high net worth individuals and their closely held businesses of a very traditional sort. So I continue to maintain that client base and it continues to expand. But about a dozen years ago, I shifted the focus of the practice uh, to really drive change. And uh, so, um, and that's what I do. And that's what's most satisfying as the kid who was once upon a time uh, um, marching for the green movement, the women's movement, the gay and lesbian movement and against the Vietnam War and so on. And I found ways to flex that muscle anew and I couldn't enjoy it more. That's awesome. Thank and you. then, and then, um... Sorry, Roy, not last but least, but um, I'd love to hear your <laughs> background and how you got into this. Uh, well, obviously, <laughs> you're uh, we're very strong in the 60s here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, my story, I'm a, a contractor. I, uh, my company, uh, Waterproof Spacements, and, and, and does structural foundation repairs. Uh, I actually kind of fell into this industry about 40 some odd years ago. Uh, just answer an ad in a paper and uh, fell in as a waterproofing company. And um, what I found was that uh, as I, I learned the work and, and saw what was going on, it, it wasn't right. The company I was with, they really weren't doing what they said they were going to do with the customers and it wasn't going to be permanent repairs. And I was disappointed in that I wasn't brought up that way. I didn't mind the hard work and things, but um so I, I knew I had to change. And so a friend of mine had worked and trained with me and he'd gone to work for another 
uh, waterproofing company who's bigger. And so oh, we're bigger, we're better, come over here. And I did. Uh, unfortunately, they were bigger, but they were no better. And so as I looked around, I surveyed the whole industry, honestly, was was just rife with, with con men and gimmickry and things. And there wasn't a, a permanently dry basement to be had. And so I knew I had to either get out or, or, or change it because um, it was just not something uh, I could put my head down uh, on the pillow at night and things. So uh, I thought I'd have to go into banking or sell insurance or something. But I thought, you know, I, I know I had a pretty good idea. Uh, I knew what not to do. And I had a pretty good idea what I wanted to do. So I had um, a wife and a baby, uh, an F-150 pickup truck, uh, one bedroom apartment in Glen Ellen, $1,700 in the bank. Uh, and with all that, I launched Permaseal, uh, put an ad in the penny saver, well, waterproof for food or, or words to that essence. Um, so the impetus for me starting the company was I, I wanted to do the right thing. I, and, and I just set out and I just told people, you know, I'm brand new. Obviously, I'm a, a young person and I'm competing against all these experienced companies, but they're doing it wrong. And I wanted to do it right. And I'll, I'll do it myself and I'll, I'll do it cheaper than anybody. And I'll stand behind my work. And, uh, and that was the genesis. Uh, very humble. We started off as the world's smallest waterproofing company. And, and today, uh, we've grown into one of the world's largest companies, and it's just simply because uh, we're just, you know, doing the right thing. And so I've always recognized that we do things differently than a lot of other companies, especially in our industry. Uh, I used to call it uh, benevolent capitalism. Uh, then one day I ran into a guy and said, oh, you got to meet these people. And, and there, it was an organization actually called Conscious Capitalists. And, and lo and behold, there's a lot of people who... Uh, think like I do, that business should do something more than, than just make money. So I have found that uh, very fulfilling. Uh, we, we make people's homes healthier and more valuable. Uh, we provide uh, a great place to work and great career opportunities for our tribal members, our employees. And then we support our community, both local, national, and, and globally even. And it's extremely uh, professionally and personally gratifying to do that. Gosh, I mean, so everybody here has the spirit of giving back. Um, that's that's just so impressive. And you know, so so one thing when we on um, the professional advisor committee was talking about, you know, a topic to come up with, and and benefit corporation was mentioned, B corporation or B corp, um, L three C. It's it's um it's interesting how so few of us really knew much about it. And I'm so glad Bill Hassett introduced us to Mark Lane. And so Mark, right now, what I hope you can do is talk about the um, social impact business models and pros and cons of each type? Yeah, uh, at 20,000 feet. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Alice. So, and again, thanks to Bill for bringing us together. I see he's with us this afternoon. Uh, and I appreciate that. So, um, social impact is a new form of currency for the traditional business community. And there are different opportunities uh, that uh, businesses have to drive social change. Uh, and uh, these various business models are a reflection of the fact that you know, we're kind of seeing greater innovation and disruption in legal and financial and tax planning for businesses. Um, so we see, for example, uh, creative ways to use uh, corporate foundations today uh, where you can do stuff that is now tax deductible uh, that wouldn't have been had you done it directly, not through a corporate foundation. So if you want to uh, support people who are suffering by virtue of COVID, for example, you could do that through a foundation. You couldn't do it directly and deduct it. If you wanted to provide for employee scholarships, you could do that too. Um, if you wanted to provide for disaster relief, we see what's going on in California, now in the East Coast in terms of climate change. Well, you couldn't really do that directly as a company or as an individual. You can do it through your corporate foundation. Uh, you can also use a corporate foundation to invest in for-profit businesses, even closely held businesses that themselves are seeking to drive social change. So we see a lot of creativity in that area. We see a greater attention to cause-related marketing and the opportunities it presents uh, for companies to share the wealth with charities that are important to them, but gain a market advantage in so doing and create a halo effect for those businesses in so doing. 
but we also see um, businesses engaging with nonprofits and mission-driven ventures in new and creative ways as strategic alliance partners, uh, as, um, as customers uh, sourcing goods and services from enterprising nonprofits and from mission-driven ventures. But we also see them investing in nonprofits and mission-driven ventures. Foundations can do it, corporations can do it, and individuals can do it. One of the ways they're able to invest in a nonprofit, uh, which has no equity to sell, is when the nonprofit creates a for-profit subsidiary or affiliate, which now affords them the ability to sell equity to businesses or others and become more financially sustainable. Uh, that's where the low profit limited liability company comes in. There are now something north of 2000 L3Cs around the country. I drafted the legislation creating that entity. It's the only for-profit business form in the nation that places mission above other objectives permanently and irrevocably, of course, requiring as well sustainability. Uh, and the idea is the L3C has a number of attributes. One, it tracks the federal tax requirements for foundations seeking to make grants or a specialized form of investment called program-related investments. Um, although this is a for-profit entity, it is specifically designed to facilitate investments by foundations and it also, and those foundations will not bear risk adjusted market rate returns. So it is itself patient capital and where the foundation's interests are aligned with those of the mission of the nonprofit or the for-profit business uh, that is seeking foundation support. About half the found of the L3Cs are attached to nonprofits. The other half are freestanding social purpose businesses. So it has a capital formation appeal to it uh, and when the foundation comes in as an early investor, which is not always the case, but can be the case, it de-risks the investment for other investors, impact investors, financial first investors, or others who come in concurrently or subsequently. The L3C also has a governance attribute, which is very appealing because it establishes by law a, an ordering of fiduciary priorities where it needs to pursue a charitable or educational purpose significantly, other objectives are secondary. So it has the effect of galvanizing stakeholders around mission permanently and irrevocably. If you look at a typical limited liability company, it's governed by an operating agreement, which can be disregarded. Its provisions can be waived. It can be amended. Here, we have a statutory requirement. So stakeholders understand that this is the way it's always going to be. Investors also come in uh, by self-selection. If they want to be supporting a mission-driven venture, this may be a good target for them. If they're not, they excuse themselves. And that really works to everybody's so, advantage. So that, um, what you're talking about then is if it were a normal corporation and they took a philanthropic approach to things, are you saying the shareholders would bring action against them because they're not um, making the biggest bang for the buck? They're doing something else? Well, there, there is, uh, this really gets into the whole notion of why the benefit corporation was created. But yes, here by law, this is, this is uh, a requirement that the L3C pursue as a charitable and educational purpose. So mm -hmm. we don't really have the shareholder primacy concern here uh, because this by law uh, demands that there be primacy in terms of charitable or educational purposes. Uh, and indeed, um, through uh, securities disclosures or other conversations with prospective investors, you know, this is fully well understood. This is why we're doing it. Uh, so that doesn't come into play, really. And then the final attribute of the L3C, as well as the benefit corporation that I'm going to describe to you, is it has a branding, signaling, and positioning advantage. So uh, stakeholders, customers, employees, uh, all understand that this venture is pursuing a mission that's important to all of us, and therefore it gains favor in the marketplace. Uh, so that's kind of one form, and there's lots of nuance to it, but that kind of describes broad strokes what the L3C is. The Benefit Corporation, on the other hand, another social enterprise form, um, must call out within its charter 
a general social or environmental purpose. Uh, and it may, if it wishes, identify a specific social purpose. And then it must report on its performance, uh, typically annually, against a third party standard. So it really builds the social ethos of the founders of the company into its DNA. And similarly, uh, the benefit corporation attracts those people that want to be in this community of interest, want to support those ventures that care about employees and the environment and the community. So it too gains an advantage uh, in the marketplace. But it's important that it you know, it honor its commitment. And that's really the, the trick here because benefits uh, corporations really operate in the community of their own and they're driving change uh, collaboratively. There is a solidarity among them as there is with all social enterprises. So now we're finding that traditional businesses, not only investing in social enterprises and nonprofits, and engaging with them in a variety of ways are creating their own social enterprises. Businesses, traditional businesses can create their own L3Cs. If they do, for example, they get the advantage of being able to secure foundation funding, which can often be non-dilutive. They have the advantage in DuPage County, for example, to be able to sell goods and services to Cook County uh, gaining a preference in procurement. There is a law that I happen to draft chairing the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation where social enterprises, uh, L3Cs, benefit corporations, and other mission-driven ventures, irrespective of form, I'm hybrid as, I'm agnostic as to form, many of them are hybrid, they get a 5% bu uh, bump in their bids when they seek to sell goods or services to Cook County. So, you know, there's really kind of a coming together of economic sectors where government, business, the nonprofit community, the financial community are all joining forces to drive social change. And the social enterprise movement is at the nexus of traditional business and philanthropy doing good work, but using market based strategies to do so. That's, um, can you give an example of a company that? Like, do you have a favorite who's really done this well? Well, I can't choose, you know, choosing favorites among one's clients is like choosing favorites among <laughs> your children. Uh, I'll give you kind of a- oh, Come a, on, we all have our favorites. <laughs> I'll give you a, a local example, which I think is done very well and may be known to many of the people on the call, a Safe Haven, uh, which is a, an organization that today has three nonprofits, uh, L3Cs, and a series of other for-profit ventures uh, they're in affordable housing, workforce development, the various stripes. Uh, they do a lot of the beautification for communities. They have a culinary arts program. Uh, they have a manufacturing company for nail polish. Uh, they train uh, uh, nail polish, nail techs, uh, as well as many others. They have a veterans program. I mean, they're really uh, cradle to grave and really empowering people. But they've they've been very successful at integrating various business, nonprofit, and hybrid forms within a, a continually growing model. Now, that presents its own challenges in terms of private inurement, self-dealing, uh, fiduciary duties. Uh, suffice it to say, upon recognizing uh, those obligations, you have the opportunity then to address them successfully to the benefit of the whole. But there, there are many examples I might give you. But it, so if somebody watching this presentation is a business owner and they want to transition into that format, an L, L3C or a benefit or a B Corp, what, what steps would they take? Uh, highly variable, dependent upon what where they're at in their life cycle, uh, what opportunities they want to pursue in, in terms of funding, in terms of branding, in terms of engagement with stakeholders. I mean, we're finding that uh, you know, I haven't mentioned the B Corp specifically, which is different from the Benefit Corporation, although people tend to confuse them because the names are so similar. But a, a B Corp is a brand. When you see the B in the circle, that is a B Corp. Uh, a B Corp uh, designation is available to any for-profit venture. It's available to L3Cs. It's available to Benefit Corporations. It's available to partnerships, proprietorships of any stripe, so long as they meet the rigorous 
sustainability criteria imposed by B-Lab, which itself is a 501c3 organization. But one of the obligations of a B uh, of a of a B Corp is if you happen to be a corporation, many are not, as I've just described, you have a, a you have a duty to pursue status as a benefit corporation. That is, uh, adjust your articles of incorporation, which any corporation can do, to become a benefit corporation. I say any corporation can do if it has the willingness and the commitment to meet the requirements of both a B Corp and a benefit corporation. Uh, so there are sustainability obligations, and then there are charter requirements in terms of pursuing a social objective and reporting periodically on social and environmental performance. L3Cs are often attached to a traditional business as a separate entity. Some transition from traditional businesses into L3Cs. Uh, we do that all the time. We can merge one into the other, we can uh, convert one into the other. And again, but it's driven by capital formation, governance and branding objectives. And how, what role you wanna place in the marketplace of ideas, how you wanna leverage your thought leadership, uh, who you wanna attract as employees, as customers, how do you wanna be perceived when you need a favor at city hall? Uh, how, how seriously do you take climate change? How, how do these things go, get integrated into your business strategy? And there are ways that we do that with clients. And it's not only CSR, it's culture. And it comes from the top down. What is it you do? We're, create, we're working with a client, happens to be in Ohio. It's the largest installer of museum exhibits in the world. Uh, and they extraordinarily successful organization and they operate globally. Well, we're putting together a highly specialized cohesive strategy within a corporate foundation we're creating and we're creating an L3C subsidiary for the purpose of monetizing their intellectual property for the social good, but also uh, to generate additional profits that can be deployed within the business to become more successful and in part to, to uh, direct more profits to the foundation that will do good work. So we look at this as kind of a three-cornered three stool, the pre-existing a traditional business, the new social enterprise affiliate, and the corporate foundation. And, and where do you put what and how do they each reinforce the mission of the other in terms of generating profits, building brand, making money, uh, laying off entrepreneurial risk on others, including foundations, but really uh, establishing a firmer footprint within the marketplace of ideas. Because I tell every social enterprise clients, every nonprofit client, we represent lots and lots of those, every foundation client, that whatever you think your mission is, um, your mission is thought leadership. What you're doing is converting your vision into action, and you're letting other people see what you're doing. So where you fall short, fail fast. Where <laughs> what you're doing makes sense and works, let them know they can follow suit and be empowered to do so as to the mission that's important to them. Because it's important that we see successes and it's important that we lose from, learn from those which are less successful. And all mm -hmm. of us, I think, share that vision and that view of the world. I agree. And I, I think that's awesome. And I'm, I'm just curious, like on the financing side of things, how are our um, banks and shareholders, are they, you know, willing to give money towards this because they believe in that or is it they they're still looking at a return on investment first uh, and foremost? Uh, uh, okay there, there is some uh, gentle movement within the uh, financial industry toward ESG I mean the president just came up with a strategy today that pension plan this was a reversing a Trump era regulation now encouraging pensions for example to invest in ESG uh, but th the reality is um, on a risk-adjusted basis, you can't expect banks or venture capitalists or other financial first investors or fiduciaries entrusted with other people's money to invest in something unless it's vetted and makes sense economically and financially. But what the L3C, for example, does is de-risk the investments because it takes non-dilutive capital or other risk capital or impact investments early stage, often, not always, sometimes late stage through mission driven investment as opposed to uh, as opposed to program related investments. But it has the effect of first um, 
uh, proving concept, uh, generating revenue, generating profits, de-risking as the stack of the, uh, capital stack advances, because many of these things are, in, the investment comes in tranches. So as you, you, know, you get to a point where soon the deal is bankable, thereafter institutional investors will take a look and start investing. We have many L3Cs that have institutional capital invested in them. And they, can, they have to compete in the marketplace. They have to do no less. They have to do more because often their missions put them at an economic disadvantage. If you have a workforce development initiative, for example, and you're employing uh, underemployed people, people that are marginal, people that are returning citizens, uh, people who are undereducated, there are additional costs associated with operating that venture. So we, we fill that market gap through foundation funding to put them on an even playing, for, pay, playing field with other companies that are doing similar things, but without the social impact. And the social impact gives our clients a competitive edge now because they're making money, they're doing good things. And now everybody wants to run and be part of that. Nobody well, wants to be the first one in the pool, but right. also nobody wants to be left behind either. So when the thing starts proving out and the concept is already proving out, they want to jump in and the traditional businesses are clearly jumping in. The whole notion of the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation is to bring together nonprofits, social enterprises, governance, uh, governments, the, the uh, investment community, all about incubating actionable social policy recommendations in which each sector has a hand. And, they, and so the commission itself is a convener, a collaborator, and indeed a catalyst. So can every business be all of those. So, that, so you bring up a good point. And um, so Roy is going to be batting cleanup for this, just for those are, who are waiting to hear from him, because there's just nothing like hearing from somebody who walks the walk and actually does business this way. But before we get to Roy, I've got some questions for Randy too. And you know, so you talked about what your background is and how you, you bring people together. Um, and it sounds like you create a team, um, but can you t tell us about some key charitable opportunities for business owners from your viewpoint? You know, I kind of, um, I kind of, I'm on the other side of the street as Mark, right? He's he's down in the trenches, structuring entities and improving that side of life. I tend to work with the already established general business owner type of person or wealth holder uh, who doesn't understand that they have plenty of capital available to do philanthropic things. Um, for whatever reason, they haven't been told, they don't understand, they don't know, they're just not uh, there yet. Mm -hmm. um, and again, many of them will say, well, we're not horribly charitable, but when you really dig down deep, you'll find out that they're on the board of their church, they're in the Rotary Club, uh, they sponsor the Little League team, they do all the things and they just don't think of themselves as philanthropic. Often I get them uh, again at the point of transition where they're selling their business or 99%, 95% of the time, they've sold their business before they were in touch with me. Uh, they've had huge liquidity events often or are about to have a huge liquidity event. Um, they're motivated to not pay taxes. Interesting thing about business owners is that every single business owner I've ever met in 36 years plus hates paying income taxes, um, every single one. Um, yet when they sell their business, some, someone doesn't get in front of them and say, by the way, there's going to be a lot of tax due. Uh, and so I, I, I get them in that moment uh, and we can show them one, one or 10 ways uh, to reduce their tax load by incorporating some philanthropic planning in the family's overall planning. Um, that requires a team it always requires a team I, I i always work with other advisors wherever they are and it can be three other people or it can be 10 other people it just depends on what the facts and circumstances are for each case but once we deploy that capital toward philanthropy then they have other decisions to make um, and that's where people like you know mark takes over um, i have always thought and i've thought this for i i started i wrote about it i think 20 years ago about it, all the people that set their money aside in charitable trusts or pooled income funds or 
uh, donor advised funds or family foundations, and then they use that investment capital as if they were just, you know, buying Wall Street uh, without thinking about we could have more impact with our impact. Uh, it just never made sense to me that those those two values systems don't get aligned at some point. Uh, and and that's something I've been working toward for as long as I can remember. Well, so you mentioned donor advice funds, and that's a, a big part of what DuPage Foundation does. Like, how how do you see, um, you know, people using their donor, donor advice funds in a well, business again, I sense? Think, I, I think a lot of folks, and, and again, you know, if you read the uh, <laughs> the common press, uh, you'll see there's all this pressure on on donor advised funds, you know, that they should be able to give them, they should give away money like foundations and have all these rules. Well, frankly, a lot of people in the middle of liquidity events um, are worried about one thing. They're worried about the liquidity event. They're worried about the exit. They're worried about what's going to happen next. They don't really have the bandwidth in most cases to think through should they decide to make a philanthropic uh, choice, they don't. They can't think about where it's going to go next. Uh, that that's usually step two or three. Unfortunately, um, there's a, exceptions with that, of course. So mm -hmm. donor advised funds are just great places not to park money, but but to really it's to to stop and think for a minute, um, right. and and is and to decide which charities are the ones my families. Uh, philanthropy want to serve, which are best suited for what we believe in, which will actually perform uh, under some standard that we have yet to set or know about. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'd like to take some time to think about how this capital gets distributed. And yeah. also just uh, another note is that, you know, donor advised funds are one of the few charitable vehicles that didn't, can take S-Corp stock. And, you know, business owners, form S corps more than they form anything else. So, you know, often as a, as a planner, it's kind of like we're stuck. We can't do anything. It's an S corp. Well, you, you can do this. You can do this. Uh, that's, that's someplace we can go. Which is another good thing to know. And, and uh, the other question I had for you too, is the talk um, or the subject of donating highly appreciated securities. Um, a lot of people don't know what the advantage is to doing that, but can you talk about that? Uh, donating highly appreciated securities is the no-brainer of no-brainers. Um, not only can I help someone get a charitable income tax deduction, and again, there's a number of strategies and structures that do this, uh, charitable lead trust, charitable gift annuities, uh, pooled income funds, donor advised funds, all of those things. Uh, I can sell my low basis stock and pay no capital gains tax. Um, with what's happening and what we think is going to happen uh, in Washington, uh, we're looking at higher rates. And this year has, has been an unbelievable year for velocity of transactions, in my experience. I, uh, my fourth quarter uh, normally starts in November and December. That's when everybody makes their philanthropic choices. I started getting busy in, in May or June. <laughs> um, and it's there's calls every day of you know I I've got this stuff right um, the 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 avoidance of capital gains tax leaves the client with a hundred percent of their assets to reinvest and a tax deduction to go with it uh, that's that's a hard formula to beat right and you talked about too the um, the people that come to you where they've sold a business and now it's like oh my god I'm faced with all of this income. Why is it important for them to see you before they sign on the dotted line to well, sell? Again, we can do some post-sale tax mitigation and for those people. Again, the the people that don't really want to pay income tax, um, you can do some post-sale mitigation. We can use grant or lead trusts or regular lead trusts. We can use donor advised funds. We can use pooled income funds. We can use all of those things, but we can never offset a hundred percent of the tax because. Our deduction is limited to some percentage of our AGI, 30% if it's marketable security, 60% mm -hmm. if it's cash, 100% if we give our money to charity, but then, which is good, but we, we don't get anything back as a family. Um, Pre-sale, uh, we can eliminate all the tax. Uh, you know, we can arrange someone's uh, planning so that when they sell whatever it is they're about to sell, 
they're not going to face any tax whatsoever. Uh, that's the best of both worlds. But it's one of those rules, isn't it, where you have to, you know, do something before there's a contract. So it's just exactly something that you have to have it before there is a signed agreement to sell. Um, right. You can be talking about it. You can have it on the market. You can even have a letter of intent. Uh, but if you've agreed to terms and conditions and a closing date, uh, it's unfortunately it's game over. Yeah, I do have a question. Like, do, you know, I, I'm curious. Like, who's been one of your favorite case studies of somebody you've helped, and what was the outcome? If you can talk about that. Oh, uh, there's 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 so many. Um, like more. <laughs> let me let me think about this. Is there a best one? Uh, there's there's never a best one, but uh, we have a number of clients uh, who we have managed to get in front of pre-sale. We're actually working with someone in California uh, who's got a very, very, very successful tech company uh, that's going to be acquired for in the uh, billions with a B. Uh, and he's already agreed uh, that we will get uh, virtually all of his shares prior to sale. Uh, he'll be able to live nicely on income uh, generated by those assets He's very socially conscious. Most of his investment capital will go back toward research development uh, and all uh, and changing, changing the world for good. Uh, but he'll pay no tax when he sells. And he's a young, young man in the under, under 40. God, and that's, I mean, just what a great way to be more impactful with your philanthropy. That's, that's amazing. Uh, you know, there are, there are a number of people, and especially we're starting to see it much more in Gen X, who, who are aware that what they want to do is make a difference in the world. It's not about them making themselves the wealthiest human being on the earth or any of those things. It's about making what they leave behind a better place. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's inspiring. And, you know, you talked about, too, you bring together, you always work with a team. Of, like, who's typically part of your team? Well, I'm I'm not an attorney, and I don't play one on TV. So we always have an attorney, um, and again, attorneys are invaluable in terms of uh, their ability to think through complex issues uh, and their experience. Uh, often, we have the, the CPA who generally knows more about the client's financial situation than the clients do. The clients always get their stuff wrong. They think they have things a certain way, and it's almost never the way they say it is. Um, we have appraisers. Uh, because when we make large gifts, uh, typically those gifts have to be valued. Um, we might have the CFO of a different company uh, that they could be in a shareholder a shareholder of to understand completely the impact of that. Uh, we might have a life insurance professional. We might have an investment professional. So uh, again, a team. We could have other family members who might be trustees or uh, successor trustees. Uh, and often uh, the entire family. So the team can get quite large, uh, but that's what makes, you know, the, that's what makes the best critical thinking. Uh, right. You know, they say you can't see your own back, back, backswing. Uh, you know, I don't know what I, I don't know what I'm missing in some cases. Uh, it's very helpful to have someone tell me, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Or, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, what about this, this aspect of the case? And we're like that too. It's very much a team approach, you know, and you just want to get the best outcome possible for whatever the situation is. And um, so moving on, last but not least is Roy Spencer from Permaseal. And um, you have to put in a plug for you because um, I love your backstory and, you know, how, how awesome. Your mom must be so proud of you <laughs> to just be out there doing the right thing. But, you know, so you are somebody who really walks the walk in the world of conscious capitalism. And what has that meant to you? Like, well, I know personally it's got to be satisfying, but professionally, how does that impact you and your employees? Well, <clears throat> conscious capitalism is a, a stakeholder model as opposed to a, a shareholder model as traditional businesses. And so, our, you know, our stakeholders are, of course, our customers, our employees, or call our tribal members, our partners, our, our vendors, our suppliers, uh, our community. Our environment, uh, as well as the owners, and so we make decisions as conscious capitalists. Uh, the decision has to be beneficial to all those parties, or we don't make it. We go back to the drawing board. What can we do that's not going to, you know, it's going to help everybody, or at least not harm anybody? So I, it's just um, makes our our decision making, you know, clearer. 
uh, in that way. Uh, professionally, you know, a lot of other business owners have asked me, say, Roy, you know, it, it's great. You're concerned about your employees and your customers and your community environment. And that's, that, that's, that's one I'm happy for you, but honestly, I got to make payroll and, and I, I got to make a profit, you know? And, uh, and I, I tell them, you know, interestingly enough, uh, running your business consciously is actually a more profitable model than the traditional model. And there's reasons for that. Um, First and foremost, when you have engaged employees, and we all have, or most of us have employees, when they're engaged and they're passionate about their work and, and, and they, they feel like they're appreciated, they're going, you know, they make a hundred different decisions every day. And that's going to be hurtful or, or, or beneficial to your company and, and to your customers. And so when they're engaged, they're going that extra mile and you're going to get a lot more productivity out of engaged employees. Uh, we have loyal customers and they, they like doing business with us. They like our, our mission. Our mission is to make the world a better place. A little grandiose for a contractor, but we do. And, 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 and people appreciate that. And so they're willing to wait a little bit longer when you have a bad storm and a little bit longer to have Permaseal come out and do it. Maybe even pay a little bit more money because they like what we're doing and how we do it. Um, our suppliers stand by us and, and our partners are tremendous and they stand by us in, 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 in tough times and, and things. And a lot of times they give us preferential opportunities that may aren't extended to some of our competitors and things. And in this tight labor market, which historically is the first time we've ever had more jobs than people, uh, we're all scrambling to try and find uh, good people. And a lot of those good people, they want to work for a purpose-driven organization, not just young people, older, mature people say, you know what, I want something more. And so we get an advantage. We get a discount uh, from those people. We've got a lot of great, talented people that can make more money working someplace else, but they like being part of a purpose-driven organization. So all these factors help us run a uh, actually way more profitable business than if I ran it on a traditional capitalist model. Mm -hmm. I mean, culture may, must make a huge difference in um, retaining or attracting talent. It sounds like you've created a really nice culture there. Oh my gosh. You know, it's, it's, it's just part and parcel of, you know, who, who we are. And we actually create a, a book called the manifesto and it tells people, Hey, this is who we are. This is how we work. This is what we believe in. And uh, if, if that doesn't resonate with you, that's okay. It doesn't make you a bad person. You're just not going to be a good fit here. You're not going to be here. <laughs> uh, you're not going to be thrive here. We have a, a, a mission to our mission. We have, you know, core values. You know, we work hard seriously. We do what we say we're going to do. We strive to be better. We act with urgency. We're compassionate. We inspire creativity, optimism, and fun. If that's not you, again, not a bad person, but you're probably not going to like it here. And so, yeah, it, it really makes it a personally, it, it's a joy to come to work uh, and, and, and share my day with other people who are, are, are like-minded, who are hardworking, ambitious, and, and, and want to be part of something bigger. So it, 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 everybody enjoys it and it helps. Again, they, they tell two friends, they tell two friends, like-minded friends, and it's, uh, it's fun. And, and we know each other because you're involved, well, a couple of ways with Sunrise Rotary in Naperville, but also because you're really involved with DuPage Foundation. And can you talk about how your donor advised fund has helped you promote your philanthropy? Well, uh, I, we're known best for being better at repairing basements <laughs> and waterproofing, uh, not for philanthropy. And so uh, the DuPage Foundation has been a godsend to us because you know we've committed uh, to uh, contribute at least 10% of our profits annually are going to help support great organizations in, in, in our community. Uh, I don't have the expertise, uh, the time nor the expertise uh, to uh, vet these organizations and and uh and distribute the the money and keep track of the record keeping and stuff so honestly uh we we started off doing that way and it was just like wow <laughs> and and so DuPage foundation has been a godsend to us they, they they we get requests all the time hey can you vet these people out and so we just turn them over to you folks and, and you vet them make sure they're legitimate charity and, and and things like that and uh we've had existing you know some of the national and global uh, organizations we support, uh, even DuPage Foundation, you guys will reach out and, and, and make contact with them and, and vet them and, and keep track of all that. So you allow us 
to do uh, what we do best uh, so we can maximize what we can, you know, contribute to the organization. So you're vital, vital to what we do. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm so glad to hear we make your life easier. Oh, um, my God. <laughs> you know, again, it's a, that's a win-win. And, you know, so what, with what you do with conscious capitalism, um, I mean, clearly you're interested in inspi inspiring other business owners to follow in your footsteps. And, you know, so, so, I mean, you're doing it, you're walking the walk, but why does it matter to you that other businesses do it too? Well, um, you know, I, I, I was brought up in the old school where you, you do your good deeds in the dark, you know, you don't tell people you, you do good things. That's it's almost, you know, uh, it, it's not right. It's not that you know, it's too much hubris or whatever. Um, but I, I found that uh, starting with my own employees, uh, you know, they like being part that they're helping make the world a better place. So we're all working hard and bringing home a paycheck and supporting their family. They feel good about that. They also feel good that the whole company and any profits we generate are going back to help the world and our local community as well as the world and all these good causes. And so they like that. I feel good. They feel good. Um, so I think it's a, in, in, important uh, for other, you know, so I'll, I'll tell you a story. I, I saw an, a full page ad years ago in, in the Tribune and it was uh, for Target and they, right at the bottom, it said, oh, we give 5% or something of our profits to charitable cause. And I go, wow, you know, I'm going to shop at Target more often. You know, I feel good about, you know, supporting companies that are doing good. And I, I think our customers do too. So we are, uh, trying to do a better job of, of letting uh, not just our customers, but in, inspiring other businesses to do good. Because like I say, it, it's, it's not only the right thing to do, it's a better business model. And well, gosh, way to lead by example. I mean, really, it's impressive. And, you know, so it seems like you, you hit on something when we're talking about these impactful strategies. And um, does it cause, uh, you know, and everybody jump in here, but it does make you think differently about who you support for, you know, your business services or where you go shopping or what restaurants you use, doesn't it? Do you, do, I mean, do you guys have a favorite place you go to because you love how they do business, you know, because of their social impact? I'll give you mine, which is Maison Savica in Naperville. And um, Hossein Shamali is a for-profit business, but oh my God, does he give back? And so he will get my business every time. I have one daughter who someday will get married. And so help me God, she's getting married there. Because <laughs> so. well, yeah, we're, we're going to eat anyhow, right? We're going to dine out and enjoy <laughs> the experience. As long as the business provides the, those things, why not? You know, we're going to enjoy the meal. And then part of our meal actually goes to help other causes. How can you not feel better about that? And, yeah, that's, and that's just a, a wonderful uh, business model that uh, that's why, you know, I like to tell our, our, our story to encourage, inspire other businesses so that they can think, hey, well, first of all, you know, if you're not thinking about that, think about it, because I honestly, Alice, I, I can't think of a single cause that we've helped an organization that hasn't come back to us in, you know, do, uh, you know, many fold. Uh, they say people hear you do good things. Oh, so we're going to use you because you help this organization and things. It always comes back to you anyhow. That's not why you do it, but it just does. So right. it's just good business, and and it makes you feel good, and it makes your employees feel good, and it makes your customers feel good. So, gosh, we just hope it's contagious because you're right. I mean, that's that's a great way to have impact. And I'm kind of curious, and I don't know the answer to this, but there's um. Like when you look at Restore, that supports Habitat for Humanity, or again, I know Naperville better. They have Serendipity that supports Little Friends, or Nami DuPage has um, a cafe and a printing business. How, you know, the, it's a little bit of a for-profit model, isn't it, with social impact? Or m maybe, Mark, you can weigh in on that. Yeah, uh, often nonprofits that are pursuing an earned income strategy that is creating a business that drives mission uh, will establish a subsidiary or affiliate to house that enterprise for asset protection reasons, if for none other. And in my view, that creates the opportunity to lay off funding on others uh, and also creates kind of this branding advantage in the marketplace. So, you know, we'll, whenever we have a nonprofit that is um, looking at earned revenue, and we encourage that, that really uh, allows both the nonprofit and its funders to be better stewards of the resources entrusted to them. If, 
if we're essentially seeding an entity which now will generate positive cash flow that then can be reinvested in growth of that subsidiary, but also uh, deployed programmatically by the nonprofit parents. You know, those are decisions that I think need to be made deliberately because they present opportunities anew. And uh, in a new unit of time, you can kind of look at the organizational structure and see what the empire ought to look like. Mm -hmm. No, it's true. And I mean, you've all given us so much to to think about. And, um, you know, I've been asking all the questions, but we have a whole panel here of attendees, too. And since this is a roundtable, if anybody would like to throw out a question, I mean, please feel free to do that. Um, and, and while you're sending in questions, I have a couple of my own, <laughs> so I'm going to keep going. But, um, but one thing, I'm a big book reader, and um, so I'm wondering if, if you guys have books that have spoken to you on this subject or that you um, are drawn to, and, and then to make a shameless plug, plug for Mark Lane, I um, bought his book, um, The Mission Driven Venture, which I'd highly recommend if you're interested in learning more about, you know, the, the ins and outs of how to do this and why to do it and that's a great book, but how about the rest of you? Mark has 36 books, so uh, that could keep you going for a while. If you want to Thank go you, through I appreciate that. But Roy, do you have a book that you've liked? I've got a couple. Of course, the cornerstone of conscious capitalism is a book called, ironically, Conscious Capitalism by uh, John Mackey of Whole Foods and a guy named Raj Sisodia. Uh, and that'll give you really uh, a good uh, thumbnail uh, approach and overall view of, of conscious capitalism, the concept, as well as the organization. The other one I, I really enjoy is more of a storybook is a uh, uh, case study book, if you will, is uh, Everybody Matters by uh, Bob Chapman or possibly Robert Chapman. But uh, uh, it just talks about a, a guy's, uh, he's a manufacturer and, uh, and how everybody in a company matters. And he tells a real personal story how that came about. And he started looking at every, his employees, well, that's somebody's daughter you know, and that's somebody's son. And I have a responsibility, you know, they're, they're here and, and, and things like that. It just really, you know, brought home to me and, and that company, his company now um, has, you know, thousands of employees and he still has that personal, you know, showing people they're important and, and which of course they are. And, and, but it's important that we show them that, you know, that they are uh, uh, noticed and uh, appreciated and, and how important they are. And uh, I think that's just really resonated with me. Mm -hmm. No, I agree. How about you, Randy? Anything you liked? Uh, you know, uh, most of what I've read is on the on the family parenting side. Uh, anything by Jay Hughes, I think, is worth everybody reading about preparing heirs uh, to receive wealth and teaching responsibility and and stewardship and lack of entitlement. Uh, one of the very first books I, I read on the subject was uh, by a woman by the name of Jessie O'Neill uh, called The Golden Ghetto. Uh, that's, that's certainly worth a read if uh, you're working with wealthy families. A uh, number of others come to mind. Uh, all well, the and, same and, subject, um, Mary. Yeah, and we'll share a reading list with people after afterwards too. So, so Rain, if you think of more, anybody thinks of more, you know, send them my way. And well, how about Mark? Even though you've written thirty six books, is there <laughs> somebody spoke who you read? Um, well, I actually spent a lot of my time not reading books on this topic, but rather reading books that are enriching through their storytelling, or you know, whether. Uh, fiction or nonfiction, you know. So I think I think part of the, part of the reality of this space is you need to be plugged into the world and not just focused on the discipline, uh, because if, in order to appreciate uh, empathically what people are going through, it's important to kind of. Uh, so I'm not going to specifically identify books or, for that matter, movies that help inform your appreciation for the struggles people are are living through or the ways people have overcome the challenges that they faced. But I think that's really part of this puzzle too, is being kind of aware and, and have the mind space to uh, tackle these problems with greater appreciation for people who live lives other than the way we live our lives. And I think that too is a challenge. Yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, it's really nice to be able to step back and, and get out of your own bubble and see what's going on in the world. And we do have one question that came through from um, an attendee. Um, it's, uh, do lenders view these benefit organization structures favorably or at least neutrally? And I think, 
you know, Mark, you covered that a little bit. Um, I think that's a Mark question, or is it a Randy? No, I think, the, I, I mean, the answer, of course, is variable. Uh, the, the, the institutions have their own decision-making processes. We, for example, uh, as of the last month, we now have uh, in this area, uh, the first women's bank. Uh, and uh, they have carved out a specific social impact strategy where they wanna support uh, women entrepreneurs, particularly uh, women of color. And they're gonna favor them with their lending and they're gonna favor organizations that facilitates the organization and growth of such organizations. Um, you look at the major institutions, you look at Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase and others, you know, they all are looking at uh, environmental, social and governance criteria in their investment selection, but also in their underwriting. Uh, and they have funds where, you know, in Chicago, for example, there's significant capital being deployed to the west and south sides. But on the other hand, there are uh, entities that are, you know, financial first. Uh, and they feel that their obligation is to return risk-adjusted financial rewards to those people whose money they're holding. Mm -hmm. And in that case, we have to make sure that the social impact entities that are created are not only financially sustainable, all of them need to be or they won't survive, but they also need to have uh, appropriate value propositions to attract the capital that they need. Uh, the, the, the one category that's kind of an exception to that rule is the growing category of impact investments, where people are looking for financial returns as well as social returns. And to the extent that social returns can be demonstrated, uh, they're prepared to forego market rates, financial returns. Uh, that certainly is the case of foundations. Uh, remember, the alternative for them to a program-related investment is a grant. That's an expense. That money goes away never to return. So when they're making an alternative decision to make an investment in a mission-driven venture, which they can do under the tax law, still counting as if they had made a grant, uh, they're concerned about, okay, what is the theory of social change? Who's managing this thing? Uh, is there proof of concept? Uh, do we want to put our two bucks on this jockey? Uh, and recognizing the alternative would have been just to make a, a, a gift, a grant. Uh, so when we look at investments, the foundation community and often the family foundation community, which doesn't typically have the same bureaucratic decision-making apparatus, will respond very favorably because often as, as Randy's pointed out, those foundations are frequently have been set up by entrepreneurs who've had an exit. And somebody gave them the bright idea, well, throw some shares into a foundation, for example, and uh, use that as your charitable hip pocket, but avoid some capital gain tax. Well, those are entrepreneurs and they're still entrepreneurs, even though they may have sold their businesses. And if you could sit mom and dad and Billy and Susie around the kitchen table and talk about your L3C or your benefit corporation, they may get excited and they be become essentially social venture capitalists through program related investments or grants to for-profit ventures. And they may also want to get Billy and Susie involved in rolling up their shirt sleeves uh, and get involved in your business. And they also will make available to you um, relationships that they enjoy and the platform they have and maybe expertise beyond money and uh, maybe their infrastructure or technology or other uh, advantages that they may contribute to what you're doing. So you kind of look at the investment uh, source of potential source of investment on its own terms. What is its mission? What is it trying to accomplish? How can you construct your value proposition to attract that capital and attract more important that relationship? I mean, this has been so interesting, you know, at least to me and I hope to everybody, but you know, just the idea of knowing what options are out there, because, you know, a lot of times we just don't know what we don't know. And I, I, I can't thank you enough for coming together as a panel to share your knowledge and your insight with all of us. And, and, and you know, to thank all the attendees for being here to learn about this. And, um, it, it, you know, it makes you think, doesn't it? So, um, you know, our decisions matter. Every day makes a difference. And um, we can all do our part to be more impactful if we choose to be. And so um, while we're sending our thank yous out to the panel, of course, you guys, thanks so much for doing this.
Um, it, so as much as you're men of the 60s, I was born in 1960. So <laughs> we're all at simpatico. Um, but you're we all like the 60s too, just by a different <laughs> definition. <laughs> just way I laugh. But um, but um, also I'd like to thank our professional advisor committee that you know the group came together to you know choose this subject and to flesh out the agenda and to you know again make this as as informative and special as we could. And, um, and also to thank DuPage Foundation for putting on a program like this. I mean, it's really nice to have the bandwidth to be able to um, bring together a group of people and share this information. Um, we will be sending out a survey to everyone and, and um, you know, please feel free to be critical because we always wanna be the best that we can be. And if there's anything we can do to be better at this, we'd like to. Um, we'll also be sending out um, a, a reading list as best we can put this together. And um, this will be recorded. So we'll be sending out a link to the, um, to the Zoom recording once it's up. And I think I've covered, are there any other questions that I've missed? Um, I think I've covered the questions. Mike right, has Kate? a question. Mike has a question? Okay, yes. Well, I, my question might be a little long, so maybe I should do this offline, but I've got a question uh, for, for Mark. So uh, if you need to end the Zoom, that's fine. No, Mark, go maybe for I'll it. Just, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead and ask the question. Okay, well, uh, so as we're, you're talking about the uh, L3Cs, one of the things that I'm thinking about is, you know, a lot of not-for-profits uh, own real estate. And I'm yes. thinking, how, how do they monetize uh, the real estate without giving up ownership control? Uh, you know, obviously they could do a traditional sale leaseback, but that doesn't tend to be economically good for a not-for-profit because, you uh, the return investors need would be higher than say a cost of debt. Uh, pay, you have to pay real estate taxes if you're just leasing, et cetera. So one of the things I was just thinking about as you're talking is, you know, is there say an, an investment appetite for appreciation in the real estate? In other words, let's say a, a not-for-profit has $5 million worth of real estate, uh, but it's willing to give up the appreciation on that real estate for someone to, you know, it, for an investor to invest in today. It's almost like selling a, you know, at the market call or something, if you will, on the appreciation. Uh, and what that could do is, you know, it could monetize, it could provide uh, capital for the not-for-profit to invest in its programs where the not-for-profit really isn't that interested in the appreciation of its real estate. So what I'm trying to do is convert the appreciation in real estate into a better use for a not-for-profit than sort of just sitting on its balance sheet. So maybe a, a complicated question, but I'm just trying to. Well, let me give you a, yeah. Uh, let me give you an answer. Uh, to the extent that the nonprofit's going to continue to use the property, the question arises: How will that appreciation ever be realized? Right. Uh, so um, there are a couple of different uh, paths here. One, uh, an L3C may be created as a subsidiary of the nonprofits. By law, the nonprofit must control that L3C. Otherwise, we get into private inurement and private benefit areas where the tax exemption of the nonprofit could be jeopardized. But you can have within the L3C the ability to create different classes of ownership. So if you wanted to bifurcate uh, uh, ordinary income from capital gain, for example, uh, you could do that and still hit maintain control. Again, the question becomes, if, if you sell it, I, you know, what, what strikes me may be a sale leaseback opportunity uh, where you realize the gain, realize the profits, and then continue to operate the property. A, a third choice that we often recommend is what's called a 501c2 organization, which is a title holding tax exempt entity where the real estate is spun off into a separate tax exempt form and it is it has greater flexibility in terms of financing opportunities but the real estate itself um, has a contractual relationship back with the nonprofit which can be very flexible and I won't get into all the nuance but there are opportunities and how that can be designed among other things it uh, insulates the nonprofit from any liability that accrues by virtue of, transactions that might be entered into with third parties, as well as any tort liability or uninsured uh, risks. So I think there, there are a number of different possibilities here, but I would always 
be ensuring that the you're, you're not over promising to a third party in terms of capital realization if the intent is for the nonprofit to continue to utilize the real estate because an ultimate sale could deprive the nonprofit of its ability to use it. So sure. that's why a sale leaseback comes to mind among other possibilities. Sure. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, are there any other questions out there? Um, I wonder if I could ask the panelists uh, just briefly, the, um, a lot of the focus has been on kind of the ownership of the entities. Um, are, I know there's many mechanisms for the employees to participate in, as we've all heard about the great resignation and all that, perhaps it's an opportunity for increasing retention. I know we could have a whole seminar and this could each panelist maybe just make one comment about that. All right, let's start with you, Randy. Well, I think, you know, what we see most common uh, is something like an, uh, an employee stock ownership plan, an ESOP, um, but there are a number of other forms of ownership or quasi-ownership, uh, stock appreciation rights, phantom equity, uh, a couple of other things that come to mind. We're actually doing this for a company out in Colorado, right? You know, the owners want key employees to be stakeholders in the company. And there's a lot of complex legal um, structuring going on currently to find a way for the employees to come in without, you know, many, many, many employees can't afford to buy the stock of the, the enterprise. So how do we find ways to have them participate and become true stakeholders uh, and still make it capital sensitive? Okay. And then how about you, Mark? Do you want to go next? Yeah. Um, we're actually doing a lot of work in this area. Uh, there, um, the, 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 the challenge with ESOPs and other similar forms is these are essentially retirement plans. And the question is, how do you share the wealth with employees today? And, uh, you know, going along with, uh, you know, Roy's whole argument, which I think is a thousand percent on point, uh, how do you continue to motivate and treat them as part of the family? So there, there are new vehicles emerging. We've been involved in the creation of a number of them. Such things, for example, uh, as a perpetual purpose trust, where shares are deposited in the hands of a trustee whose, whose uh, fiduciary duty is to uh, be accountable to all beneficiaries, including employees, sometimes including community representatives, including ownership, existing ownership, of course. And there are ways of kind of sharing the wealth currently uh, thereby um, attacking this problem of income disparity that we face as a society, as well as wealth disparity, because ownership, you look at the future of work conversations, ownership in businesses is the real way we're going to deal with this uh, socioeconomic disparity that is really plaguing our society and accounting for all kinds of social problems and antisocial behavior. But it also is a way to inspire and empower and enrich and reward employees for their productivity in real time rather than waiting till retirement, which is nice, but it doesn't serve the immediate purpose of giving them wealth today based upon their productivity. And that's the area in which I'm most interested. And, and so Roy, again, great to wrap this up with you. How do you handle that with your business and your employees? Well, I'm a big fan of uh, giving people uh, opportunities to uh, do more and get paid more and create more. When they create more value, uh, they get paid more and anything we can do to uh, in, in, inspire them and, 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 and things to bring more value. Uh, we've looked at uh, ownership and things, but I, I think the most important thing, as you, you mentioned, I think, Alice, is, is just the employee engagement. I think our employees and our tribal members feel like this is their company. And when the company does well, they're going to do well. And we do everything we can to make sure that that's real and, and, and palpable and a real feeling. So in a way, this is their company without technically, as, as Mark would tell you, <laughs> technically for them becoming owners, it, it, it's really hairy. And uh, I really don't think it's necessary. And uh, even uh, the accumulate, we've we've uh, had uh, employees start their own businesses, you know, spin off from here, and I glad to help them. Anything we can do uh, to to help them that way. So uh, I don't like 
having any lids on anybody's income and, and everybody has a great career path and things. So I don't think everybody can be an owner of business, but I think we all have an entrepreneurial and uh, free enterprise uh, aspect uh, to what we, we want to do and anything we can do to nurture that uh, uh, within our company, we do. And, and when that happens, when you have an employee that's done well and they get rewarded, is that information shared with the other employees to inspire oh, them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a tribe. People are going to talk regardless uh, if you, you tell them or not, you know, type thing. So we we advertise that. We celebrate that when people have successes and, and people will, will know and they encourage one another and uh, inspire one another. So, yeah, that's, that's super important as part of our culture. That makes sense. Are there any other questions out there? No, we're going to wrap up a little bit early. I bet you are all disappointed to be getting out of a Zoom call early, aren't you? <laughs> well, anyway, I'll just have to close again with thanking everybody for being here today, the attendees, the panelists, and um, we hope you all have a wonderful day and we'll be following up with you. So take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank Bye -bye. you.